Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Infection Prevention and Image Guided Therapy and Mobile Surgery for Today and Beyond COVID-19 webinar. I am overjoyed to have you all here for this educational opportunity gathered from across the United States and beyond. It's my pleasure to be with you today. My name is Josh Kramer, and I am a Clinical Application Specialist for IGT with Philips North America, and it is my pleasure to present this opportunity on behalf of Philips Diagnostic Imaging Education. Just a little bit about me. Um, I currently reside in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with my beautiful wife, Hannah, and our daughter, Darcy. Um, I was born and raised in Charlottesville, Virginia. I uh, went to x-ray school at Piedmont Virginia Community College. Um, did all my clinicals at uh, the University of Virginia, where I also went to um, IR school. Uh, they have a special program there for interventional radiology and special procedures, uh, post-grad for x-ray students. Um, phenomenal year of education. Um, I highly, highly recommend it and recommend looking into it, um, especially if you're looking to uh, specialize in interventional radiology um, or neuroradiology special procedures. Um, it was a perfect pathway, uh, perfect diving board for me to jump into my VI exam. Uh, speaking of the VI exam, um, I also work as a VI board exam consultant with the ARRT. That's probably one of my favorite things I get to do with my career. Um, it's a really neat thing for me to be involved in. So we have this webinar broken down into three different sections. Uh, status quo, what's, what's happening right now? Uh, what can we be doing right now? And then what is to come? So naturally, let's start out with what's happening right now, our status quo. So I would like to preface um, what we're gonna hear in this webinar uh, with I know there's some things that are going to come up that are things that you have probably seen before. I know working in my time in hospitals, um, I went through computer-based learnings and modules and competencies and whatnot that had to do with infection control, um, infection prevention, cleaning protocols, et cetera. Um, so I know these are things you've seen before if you've been in healthcare long enough, um, even short enough. Um, but it's a good foundation to have, and it's a really good place to start, especially in light of with, uh, what's going on in the world around us. So COVID-19 is what's going on in the world around us. So these statistics are as of April 30th. Uh, the end of April is a good cutoff date. So as of that date, a little over 3 million people have been infected globally, and a little over 1 million people have been infected in the U.S. Unfortunately, the grim side of this is that people have passed away. Um, a little over 217,000 globally, a little over 60,000 in the U.S. Now, a lot of people have tried to draw some sort of correlation between COVID-19 and the flu. Um, so let's look at those numbers. So the CDC says that flu season runs between October and the beginning of April. So there's an estimated 39 to 56 million people that have been infected with the flu. And that's such a large range because a lot of people get the flu and um, aren't sick enough to seek out medical attention. Um, they just get it, deal with it, and move on their merry way. So there's a broad range of people that get it and are never reported. So there are anywhere between 18 and 26 million that seek some sort of medical attention uh, for their flu-like symptoms. Of those people, 410,000 to 740,000 end up being hospitalized um, for their flu-like symptoms. And then uh, anywhere between 24 and 62 uh, thousand people have passed away as a result of the flu. So we see the high end of that death total with the flu, 62,000, being pretty close to what we are seeing um, with the 60,000 plus people that have passed away uh, so far as of April 30th, 2020, uh, from the coronavirus. So COVID-19, uh, coronavirus, uh, the flu, those aren't the only bugs that we are worried about when we are uh, trying to clean between cases, doing the daily cleanings that we do. Um, there are a lot of different bugs in and around the hospital that we are making sure um, they are not reaching our patients. So obviously it is our job to make sure that that doesn't happen. It counteracts the whole reason why we show up to work, right? So a study that was done last year found that 55% of healthcare associated infections uh, were found to be transmitted by us healthcare workers while caring for our patients. Again, offsetting the, the whole reason why we do what we do. Um, now this wasn't just confined to the hospital. This was found in both inpatient and outpatient settings. So Elias and company found that 
a lot of the touch points that we are commonly have our hands, have our fingers and whatnot on, uh, were the most contaminated objects. Uh, seems to make sense, right? Um, they also cited a study from 2014 that saw that 41.7% of x-ray tubes and 91.7% of control panels and imaging plates had contaminants on them. Um, at a hospital I worked at in Virginia, actually at the University of Virginia, infection uh, control would go around and they would swab random things in units, stick them on a petri dish and bring them back. And it was amazing the stuff that, that came back. If anything, it made me want to wash my hands even more than I already did. Um, but you see a lot of the touch points, a lot of the things that we are commonly coming into contact with are the most common places for contaminants. So let's talk about the role of medical imaging and radiology in the realm of COVID-19. So PCR testing, which just very quickly, and this is outside the scope of this webinar, and I'll explain it to the best that I know how. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. And basically what it does is it takes the DNA of whatever the sample is, it multiplies it and magnifies it to a point that it could be easily analyzed and hopefully some sort of diagnosis can come from it. So these PCR tests, have been the primary method for some sort of diagnosis for COVID-19. And I use the word definitive loosely here because there are a lot of tests that have made it to market in a quick amount of time and haven't gone through the proper steps for testing uh, to be able to make it to this point. That being said, those kits have variability. The accuracy is dependent on the, the how good the sample is, how good the user is. Um, it could be better or it could be worse depending on who's doing it and, and what kind of test it is. Because of that, there's pockets and there's areas within the country, within the world, where they have started to kind of lean into CAT scan to be used for diagnosis. Um, because either the kits aren't available, the turnaround time's too long, or they're just not good enough. Now, there's not a general consensus about using CT as a first-line test, but there is an agreement about using CT for monitoring and to confirm a diagnosis. Um, the great thing about CT is that it is very sensitive for detecting pneumonia. Um, so you can have a, you know, unequivocal test and then show a CT as, as, uh, as pneumonia and, you know, do what you want with that information. But conversely, if a patient seems to be getting better, the CT will start to show the pneumonia going away. So it's good up front. It's also good on the back end. So let's talk about the different ways that infections can be transmitted. Uh, first and foremost, we have direct contact. It's probably the most basic means of, of transmission um, through either physical touch or direct droplet. Now, what I mean by direct droplet is somebody sneezing or coughing directly on you and you feel those droplets hit you. We've all had that happen um, where maybe our child sneezes in our face. I have it happen frequently, um, but it's it's the one that we're the most aware of and we're like wiping it off of us and whatnot. You, I'm going to get sick. Direct contact. Um, airborne in droplet, very, very similar in the sense that we're talking about droplets through the air. The difference is the size in the droplet. With airborne, the small respiratory droplets, we're talking about five micrometers or smaller moving through the air that we inhale, lands on us, etc. Um, and we're talking about sneezing and coughing again, but also laughing, exhaling, um, anything that is causing air um, and those, those droplets within the air to leave our body uh, to be transmitted elsewhere, considered airborne. Droplet, again, droplets through the air, this time large, greater than five micrometers. Coughing and sneezing again, um, within about three feet um, of, the, of the person who is infected. Um, enteric. Um, these are exposures to body secretions, uh, so phlegm, probably the most most common one we think of, and then bloodborne, the the one that I feel like we probably deal with and we're most aware of on a daily basis um, because of the sharps that we are constantly coming into contact with um, in and around the lab and OR environments. So I'd like to discuss how these infections can spread. So an infection first needs a source, some sort of infectious agent. Now these can be viruses, bacteria, or other microbes. Um, and then we're around infectious sources all the time working in healthcare. Um, this could be people around us, both patients and healthcare workers. We're around living, breathing bodies all day long, uh, whether they're employed there or they're admitted. Uh, surfaces and other environmental items 
it's amazing how many things we come into contact with on a regular basis, even when we do wash our hands frequently. Um, you've got dry surfaces like countertops, bed rails, medical equipment, um, wet surfaces, and moist environments like sinks and faucets and, and ventilators. Um, indwelling medical devices like catheters, IV lines, um, and then we're always walking around construction at, at our facilities. So you have construction dust, um, other debris that could be left behind from that. Um, but then we also have visitors and family members. We're constantly thinking about our patients being sick, but there are many other people walking the halls, the lobbies, and the waiting rooms at our hospitals. Um, people can be carrying these infectious agents around uh, without showing any signs or symptoms of illness. So we, we have our sources. Um, the next thing you need in the chain of infection is to have a susceptible person. Uh, now these are people who are not vaccinated or immune to a specific infectious agent or have compromised immune systems. Now there are many factors that increase a patient's or a person's susceptibility to an infection. Um, you've got underlying medical conditions like diabetes, cancer, organ transplantation, um, as these can weaken a person's immune system, just to name a few. Um, honestly, in this stressful time, we could even say that stress itself could weaken the immune system. Uh, taking certain medications, including, including uh, chemotherapy, steroids, antibiotics, can increase some risk of infections. Um, and the medical interventions, such as surgery, um, urinary catheters, IV access, lines, um, as these provide additional points of entry into the body for infectious agents, um, and they may increase the risk of infection. And lastly, in order to cause an infection, this infectious agent needs to be transmitted to the susceptible person. Um, now, this list, of course, isn't exhaustive, but the general modes of transmission include contact with a microbe from uh, the susceptible person, uh, sprays and splashes, uh, inhaling the microbe, and then your good old sharps that we talked about. Um, now, preventing or controlling the spread of infectious agents through these common modes of transmission requires different levels of precaution to be taken, uh, depending on the infection of concern uh, and the patient or environmental factors. Um, so next, we'll talk about what these precautions are. So standard precautions were developed in 2007 by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, and they include what you may be familiar with as universal precautions. Now, these simple mitigation efforts serve as the primary way to prevent healthcare-associated infections. Um, standard precautions apply to all patient interactions um, and include uh, proper hand hygiene, um, using PPE appropriately, especially when you think you're going to be in contact with blood or any sort of bodily fluid, um, cleaning and disinfecting uh, the things that we use on a regular basis, um, linen and laundry, uh, laundry cleanliness, so wearing uh, properly laundered scrubs in the, um, in the, the surgical environment. Um, safe injection practices, uh, taking care of those sharps uh, in an appropriate manner, and then uh, placing patients into appropriate levels of uh, precautions if warranted. The second tier of infection control practices beyond standard precautions is transmission-based precautions. Now, these are used in conjunction with standard precautions, and they're broken into three distinct categories. We have contact, droplet, and airborne. So contact precautions are used when patients are known or suspected to have infections uh, that have a greater risk for direct or indirect contact transmission. So we think of this as MRSA, VRE. Um, now, contact precautions include uh, placing the patient into a single patient private room, uh, and then using the appropriate P uh, PPE depending on your facility. This is typically gowning and gloving. Um, but not only using that PPE, also using it appropriately, and that can be said about all PPE for any transmission-based uh, precaution. Um, we would limit the patient transport through the facility, um, utilize dedicated um, or disposable patient care equipment, and then we would frequently clean and disinfect the room um, as much as feasibly possible. Now remember, hand hygiene and your normal standard precautions, uh, they're still required, they're still important whenever you're caring for patients that are under contact precautions. But again, uh, gown and gloves, standard uh, protocol for contact precautions.
Now, I did bring a few of these up before, but some of the common pathogens that we would run into with a patient that is under contact precautions would be hepatitis B and C, HIV, C. diff, MRSA, VRE, and the norovirus. Now, it's important to follow the correct hand hygiene procedure depending on what pathogen your patient is known or suspected to have. Uh, for example, I bring this up because of C. diff. C. diff is kind of a little different in this list of, um, of pathogens because uh, normal alcohol hand sanitizer does not uh, kill C. diff. You have to wash your hands with soap and water. Rub them together. It's that mechanical action. I'm sitting here rubbing my hands together as I'm saying it because uh, it's that, that rubbing action that, that removes the microbes. It helps it get flushed out in the drain with that water and soap. So really, really important. C. diff must use soap and water. Okay, so the next transmission-based precaution we will discuss is droplet precaution. Now, this is used when patients are known or suspected to have infections caused by pathogens transmitted by respiratory droplets. Now, these droplets are typically produced by coughs, sneezes, um, and even just talking. Uh, now, droplet precaution is implemented only if the droplet is greater than 5 micrometers. Remember, I said earlier with airborne, it's less than 5, so droplet is greater than 5. It's possible for the respiratory droplets to travel up to six feet. Now, droplet precautions include uh, placing the patient into a single patient space like a private room, uh, use of PPE, limited patient transport through the facility, um, and then also placing a mask on the patient. So very, very similar to contact precautions, it's just now the patient is going to wear some sort of mask. And again, hand hygiene and other standard precautions still required when handling uh, and interacting with patients in droplet isolation. Um, really the only additional PPE that you would need in addition to contact would be a procedural mask and eye protection. Now some of the common pathogens that we would run into with patients that are under droplet precautions would be the flu virus, uh, B pertussis or the whooping cough, uh, group A streptococci, the adenovirus, the rhinovirus, and then mycoplasma pneumoniae, which is commonly referred to as walking pneumonia. All right, so the final transmission-based precaution that we're gonna talk about is airborne. So this is used when patients are known or suspected uh, to have an infection that's transmitted by these particles um, that I mentioned are less than five micrometers in size. Now, these particles um, are capable of traveling long distances and still being infectious. Now, the precautions that we're going to include um, are much of the same as we've seen before, but now we're also going to throw a mask on the patient. Um, we're going to place them to a special isolation room that has negative pressure or an airborne infection isolation room. Um, these negative pressure rooms keep air from moving out from under the door frame or out whenever the doors open um, to let people in and out. It keeps all the air in the room and, play, and puts it through a special filtration in the ceiling. Um, we're also going to make sure we limit the people in and out of the room and the people who are actually going in and out of the room. Um, if we have uh, healthcare personnel that might be susceptible, uh, to some sort of uh, transmission. We're going to make sure that they are not taking care of this patient. Um, we're going to use the appropriate PPE. This might be an N95 mask. It might be a special hood or a suit, um, whatever your facility deems to be appropriate. We're going to make sure that this patient is not going to be just moseying about through the facility as well. Um, if they might be on their way to radiology, might be on their way to, to, to somewhere else, um, we're going to really make sure that we limit their movement throughout the facility and uh, make sure it's only done when necessary. Um, but then we're also going to really keep track of who is going in and out of the room, who has had contact with that patient. Um, if uh, they were exposed to this patient before this patient was known to be under airborne precautions. We're going to follow the, the personnel and uh, make sure that uh, if immunization is appropriate that we, we take care of that. And again with the airborne PPE, hand hygiene, standard precautions just as important as it is with anybody else. Um, but again the common PPE that we're going to see for airborne are going to be these N95 masks or some sort of PAPR, which is a powered air purifying respirator. Could be just a, a hood that you wear, uh, could be a helmet with a little plastic thing that comes down underneath with a motor that kind of um, keeps pure air circulating through, excuse me. Um, but something that's gonna keep you from breathing in those airborne particles. So the common pathogens that we see with airborne precautions, uh, we'll start with the measles. 
Um, varicella zoster or the chicken pox. TB, which is the most common thing we probably think about um, whenever we think about airborne within 95 masks. Um, Aspergillus uh, species, which can cause uh, fungal infections, smallpox, and then now finally on the list, uh, COVID-19. Now let's look at COVID-19 in the realm of infection control. So this novel coronavirus is primarily transmitted through droplet and direct contact. Uh, facilities should follow the standard environmental cleaning and disinfection procedures uh, based on the local guidelines at your facility. Now, when provided direct care to patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, um, healthcare workers should use standard contact and airborne precautions with the addition of eye protection. Now, I won't spend a ton of time on this, but it is important to follow a proper workflow when donning and removing PPE in order to avoid contamination and break the chain of infection. Um, now, the CDC has many helpful resources, including these posters, which are available for download as PDF documents. Uh, go download them, print them, post them however you want. But a lot of them are kind of common sense. You want to make sure that something that's contaminated is not going to touch something that is not contaminated. And in the process of removing your, your garment, um, that you're not going to contaminate yourself. So let's talk about the things right now that we might be seeing in our departments and immediate work areas. Um, and we're seeing a lot of these things across the board. So decreased volumes, we're seeing that everywhere. Um, of course, a decrease in volume and caseload means uh, decreased revenue being brought into the hospital, uh, which is why we're seeing layoffs, furloughs, decrease in work hours and workforces. Uh, cases are being rescheduled, even canceled. Uh, we're seeing mandates from governments, uh, state governments, saying that uh, no elective procedures and cases are to be done, that they need to be pushed off. So all of those electives that are being pushed off aren't just going away. They're going on to some sort of case backlog. So we're seeing um, a schedule for down the road being, being built up and built up and built up. Um, but even some of these patients that might be on that backlog, um, through this um, scenario we're going through in the world today, um, they might have lost their job. And in the process of losing their job, they might have lost their insurance. So the eligibility that they have to even have that procedure might be different um, if they even have any eligibility at all. We're seeing social distancing um, within the, the hospital setting. Uh, we're seeing PACUs. Um, pre- and post-procedural areas, um, the, the amount of patients that are in there um, are a lot lower, obviously, because our decreased volume, but we're making sure that patients aren't passing each other directly. We're trying to social distance our patients as well. Think about a normal PACU or a pre- or post-procedural area. On any given day, we're seeing plenty of people in there. Uh, they might have like plenty of bays, and a lot of those bays are full with patient after patient after patient right next to each other, either getting ready or recovering from their procedures. Um, we're definitely not seeing that. There's some hospitals that are implementing policies that are making sure that there's only one patient in that area and uh, another patient does not come into that pre or post area until the previous patient has completely left the department. Um, for the, the hospitals that are still doing outpatients with their imaging centers, um, where they would usually schedule, say, a, a CT or an x-ray or whatnot every 5, 10 minutes, we're not seeing that anymore. We're, we're seeing those spaced way out so there's no passage of outpatients past each other. We're seeing cross coverage in the sense that uh, I have a friend of mine here in Pittsburgh, works in an EP lab as a technologist. She has been helping out with housekeeping at her local hospital here. Um, another technologist there has been helping out with transport. We're seeing people pulled from areas where there's not a lot of volume because of the decrease in cases um, and being put out into other areas in the hospital to help out. And, and like I said, including housekeeping. And speaking of housekeeping, um, they're on the front lines of this just as much as the rest of us. So um, if you see your housekeeper, um, make sure you thank them. They are constantly facing um, uh, bugs, dirty rooms, bacteria, etc. cetera, um, on, on a daily basis. And half the time they're walking into a lab and had no idea what was just in there or what kind of isolation it was or whatnot. So um, next time you see your housekeeper, um, give, them, give them a nice thank you. Um, and then one of the other things that we're seeing is the implementation of, of, of new ideas, um, new processes. Um, this is a brand new virus that's going around that's hitting uh, the world in a way that we haven't seen before. Um, so we're seeing hospital management 
and uh, administration uh, try to kind of implement new new ideas on the fly to try to mitigate what might be happening, what might be in front of them right now. So there's a lot of new stuff going on that may or may not work. Um, a lot of experimental um, ideas, you could say, that may or may not work, but we're seeing a lot of change in a lot of different ways. So the other thing that we're seeing are uh, a change in practice, if you will, of how cleaning and disinfecting is happening. Um, kind of went to the extreme with the pictures here, but typically you just have somebody um, with gloves on, with wipes, wiping down whatever they need to wipe down. Um, here during COVID-19, we're seeing people in full suits uh, wiping everything down, including the wall. So it's not so much like I have here that there's cleaning and disinfecting that are that are happening. It's not necessarily the procedures are going to change. It's more the emphasis in the PPE protocols um, that are probably going to change. Um, to that point, it's really important that you check with your hospital, uh, whether it's your environmental services, whether it's infection control, um, to to figure out which PPE protocols and cleaning protocols. Uh, should be followed, and who's responsible for providing the PPE for the people they're going to be cleaning. So also within our facilities, we're, we're seeing a, an emphasis on trying to prevent cross-contamination. So when I see the, the phrase cross-contamination, I think of my time as a teenager working in, in, in food service, uh, working at a restaurant. Um, and there is a huge emphasis on not touching something dirty with your gloved hands and then all of a sudden touching something clean or raw food and cooked food or whatnot. Um, we're watching the public today. We drive people, I'm sure we drive by people all the time or walk past people that are wearing gloves, right? And But they're touching everything with their gloves and it kind of defeats the purpose of the whole cross-contamination thing or whatever they're trying to prevent themselves by wearing gloves. So in the hospital, we're already aware of it, but we're kind of have a heightened awareness of it now of every surface that we touch, everything that we touch, everything that we come into contact with. Um, not only come into contact, but the distance that we have between us and other people, the social distancing within the hospital setting. Um, we're wanting to try and keep our distance between infected patients and non-infected patients and personnel, um, and then minimize the, the amount of time that we're around them and wearing the PPE appropriately, uh, whatever uh, is, is called for at the time. Again, universal protocols with hand hygiene, personal hygiene, and then really, really drilling down and making sure that however we're cleaning and disinfecting, we are doing it appropriately for whatever we're trying to, to kill. But we're also seeing in the era of COVID, um, a separation between COVID and non-COVID patients. We have dedicated COVID ICUs at a lot of places. Elective procedures aren't happening like we've talked about. The flow of people within the hospital, even to get into the hospital, whether they are our, um, our personnel visitors, family members, vendors, whatnot, um, a lot of places are are streaming them through one entrance. Everybody can be screened, checked off, temperature checked and whatnot, and then they can go their own way. Um, so a huge change um, in the era of COVID. So speaking of strict cleaning protocols, I want to at least bring up and touch base on how to clean um, the IGT systems you might come into contact with. Um, the most important thing I can say is to consult the IFU for your particular system. I know with Philips, we have a cleaning and disinfection system on all of our stuff. Um, make sure you consult that because it's going to give you a really good idea of what you can use, what you can't use. Um, and especially in this time, you want to be able to use stuff that is going to be effective um, against COVID-19, which is something we're going to talk about here shortly. Again, speaking of those IFUs, um, for the Azurian uh, in section 14.1, the Zenition, uh, 7.5 is going to be where you're going to find uh, those cleaning protocols. The nice thing is that whether you have a new or an old version of any of our systems, they all clean the same way. So whatever you use on one, you can use on the other. You don't need to buy multiple different types of disinfectant in order to have uh, the cleaning supplies for all your rooms. So this is a list of disinfectants um, that are compatible with the Azurian and older generations, such as the Allura. Um, but also on this list are disinfectants that the supplier claims work well against the coronavirus. 
the most important thing I can tell you about anything on this list is that you look at the data sheet provided by the manufacturer. Sometimes it's on a piece of paper that comes in the box. Sometimes it's online. Um, most of the time, it's actually on the container itself to make sure that you know the required contact time, to make sure the disinfectant is working, that you're not just wiping this off and then up, up, and good. Uh, really, really, really important to know the times. Um, some of these that are in green are on the end list, uh, which is something that we're going to get to here uh, shortly, and we'll make sure that everybody has a link to the end list at the end of uh, this webinar. So we know what's going on now, so what can we be doing now? So one of the things we should be doing now is making sure that we are cleaning in an efficient manner. Um, and the best way we can do that is be familiar with the things that we are using to clean and the things that we are supposed to be cleaning. One of the ways to do that is to, again, consult the IFU, like I talked about before, make sure that we know we are using a cleaner that is compatible with the things that we are cleaning. But also, and I bring this up during handovers of new labs frequently, um, because I feel like it's something that, that just isn't very widely known. Touchscreens and monitors need to be cleaned with an alcohol-based cleaner only. The other cleaners that you use are too corrosive and could damage the screen. For touchscreens, what will happen is it will start to lose its touchability. It won't sense you touching or trying to do whatever you're trying to do on it anymore. For our large format screens, for uh, Philips, the, the Flex Vision screen, what it'll do is it'll start to leave a film on the screen and it will leave um, that film and degrade your image quality. Um, I've gone into a few sites where um, I would just take a bunch of alcohol prep pads, the same thing that you would swab an IV with, and just go over the whole entire screen and and clean it between a case if I notice it during a case um, and see if people notice a difference when they start the next case. It's amazing how clear it can look if you use the proper, uh, the proper cleaning tools. Um, the other thing with the FlexVision screen is that uh, it might strip away uh, the surface coating, the anti-glare coating that's on there, again, degrade your image quality. So really, really, really make sure any screens, any touch screens, alcohol only. The other thing we can do is make sure with our cleaners that we're using something, especially with the coronavirus, that is rated to kill the coronavirus. A lot of our cleaners that we have actually say coronavirus on the label. And it's funny that this gets brought up and people are like, wait, 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 I thought coronavirus is new. It's not. Coronaviruses have been around for, for a while, and some of these cleaners have already caught up to being able to kill the coronavirus. So, so this is a wonderful, beautiful tool. Show it to all of your friends. This is from the EPA. This is what they call list in. It's actually a um, pesticide list, believe it or not. But there are many fields on here for you to search for whatever specific cleaner you have in your lab to make sure that it is um, compatible with being able to kill the coronavirus. You can either use the search area at the top left of the screen to search everything on the table, or you can search specific columns, the product name, the company, um, the contact time. If you want something that's going to be three minutes or less or whatnot, you can, you can search all of these. Get the table to look the way that you want with the cleaners you want, export to PDF, print it, save it, post it, however you want to do it. But make sure that the cleaners that you are using are on this list. Another thing I would suggest is to use a turnover cart. If you're doing your own turnovers, you don't have housekeeping coming in and, and turning your rooms over for you, have a centralized location like a cart where all of your cleaning supplies are and then the other things you need to basically have a room ready for a patient to roll in. So sprays, wipes, linens, bags, uh, pillows, pillowcases, etc. common supplies. Have them all in one area. That way you're not looking all over the lab. Uh, for all of your supplies and whatnot. It's nice to have them in one place. The other thing you can do is make sure that you're keeping yourself safe at home. It's not just while you're at work you need to be safe. You need to be safe at home too. So the CDC has a wonderful website for being able to keep your home environment nice, safe, and clean for you and your family because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of the patients that you come in to take care of. 
So the other thing we could be doing right now is making sure that we are utilizing our lab as efficiently as possible. And a good place to start is during your cases. If you have extra people that are able to float during your cases, um, make sure that they are anticipating the needs of the case as far as maybe getting extra catheters out or getting a catheter if you see you're having trouble, having those things ready to be uh, open and available as opposed to waiting on, um, waiting on somebody else to do it. Um, if you do have somebody else available during a case, it'd be great if they could even come back into the control room. And if you're a lab that does filming, annotating, whatnot, they could be doing that during the case. One of the beautiful things about the Philips Azurian is that we have a feature called Parallel Workflow. We have two monitors. One is the acquisition monitor where all the action is happening. The other is the review monitor, which kind of is together but separate. It's separate in the sense that nothing that's happening on the live monitor will affect or kick you out of what's happening on the review monitor. So you could be filming, annotating, measuring, getting things ready to get sent off the packs all while the case is happening. So as soon as your last picture is taken, within a few seconds, you can essentially be done with all the imaging of your case. It's really, really great. The other thing you could do is analyze the, uh, the inventory that you're using during the case. Um, and in and, and your labs, are, is there inventory you're using a lot of that maybe you could be getting at a better price? Is there inventory you're not using a lot of and it's just sitting around and expiring? That's a good time to get organized in that sense as well. Also with billing, if you're a lab that does your own coding, um, make sure that your codes are actually going through and you're actually uh, getting the revenue back for it. Check with your finance or your billing department and make sure they're not getting things kicked back to them that maybe they aren't telling you about. It's also a good time to make sure you have an updated version of the coder. Um, and one of the things that I see all the time is 3D work is frequently not billed appropriately. Um, so there might be some money your department's leaving on the table. Just kind of look at those few things and maybe see if something helps out. But I bring all this up is because the future is coming. It's inevitable, right? It's the future. But we also know in the future is that big, huge case backlog we were talking about before. So if you could practice now and do cases now, the few that you're doing, like it's three o'clock in the afternoon, you got 20 cases waiting and you're the one on call, right? There's a sense of urgency there. If you could practice that sense of urgency now and get these new habits into play, it's really, really going to help you out in the future. So the other thing we could do now is bubble up some ideas. So I talk about this on initial handovers of new labs all the time. Um, is there a new process that's better than what's currently being done right now in your lab? Uh, making a change during a time where things are new, such as the installation of a new lab, um, and different, such as what's going on around us right now, um, it's a good time to make a new idea stick. Um, I kind of say, what could it hurt? Um, you know, if you try it a few times, it doesn't work. You just kind of revert back to what you were doing before. Um, there's no current playbook for what's happening in the world today. Um, there are more ideas that are kind of getting thrown around that are fair game. I mentioned earlier that administration and management kind of using people in different ways um, and kind of floating people to other, other areas. So there's a lot of things that are, quote, unquote, fair game right now that wouldn't normally be. Uh, the other thing I also want to encourage you to do is, is to find your purpose. So self-reflection is never a bad thing. It's always a great idea to step back sometimes and ask yourself what gets you out of bed in the morning. Uh, what makes you feel like you're giving your all and you're being utilized for all that you're worth? Um, one of my favorite books talks about being used and being known. And I know just a few seconds ago I said, you know, use somebody in a certain area. Um, but when we say that, oh, we'll use so-and-so in the recovery area today, um, you know, we're almost relegating people down to a tool uh, because we use screwdrivers and we use shovels and we use trucks, but we know people. Um, so saying or, or being told, I know so-and-so would be great in the recovery area today, it feels so much better to be known um, than it is to be used. And you feel like you're worth more uh, when you're known as opposed to being used. So just a little tidbit to kind of keep in the back of your mind, but, but look at yourself, examine yourself. Um, you know, what's your purpose? What gets you up in the morning? Do you love what you're doing? And what could you be doing more to make that, um, make that better for you? And we are on the home stretch here with what is to come. So one of the things that we know is coming is the second wave. And I don't mean the second wave of COVID patients. I mean a wave of the case backlog that we have talked about a little bit before. So while the world was flattening the curve to make sure that hospitals weren't going to be overwhelmed 
with that curve that we were trying to flatten of an influx of COVID patients, we're going to have this influx of outpatients that have been sitting at home waiting for their procedures for months now. So in order to work down that backlog, we're going to see some creative scheduling. And that might include, um, from what I've seen in some places, some weekend outpatient scheduling. Some places already do it. It was a, it was a regular practice. Um, some places don't. And you might start seeing that. So maybe weekend outpatient scheduling, maybe later into the evening, earlier in the morning, if you could do it any earlier in the morning. Um, but there's going to be a way to try and get this case backlog worked down as quickly as possible. That decreased revenue um, is going to turn into an hopefully increased revenue uh, with the backlog being worked down. Um, the insurance issues that I brought up before, um, patients that had prior authorization for a procedure might not have it anymore. Uh, recurring patients that you had come back, your repeat offenders might have new information from a new job that they got because they lost their old one. Um, this is all going to be an increased workload on uh, front desk and clerical staff. And then your follow-up patients from COVID patients. So what I mean by that is, is patients that were COVID positive before that aren't anymore. Uh, question that should be asked is what is their actual isolation status and what PPE should be used? Uh, again, this is kind of a new thing, a new playbook here. Um, so how are your previous COVID patients going to be handled now? Also, what's to come is how we have learned from what's going on right now. And we're going to make sure that we're ready should this ever occur again. Um, this can be looked at as almost a really slow rolling or a long-term MCI. What, I, what I mean by MCI is a mass casualty incident. So some uh, current trauma facilities have an MCI response team for acute short-term events. Um, but again, this season has been really slow and drawn out. Um, so looking at it and being ready from that standpoint. Um, we're also going to see some new practices and standards come out from this. Um, we've seen the CDC recommendation on masks and PPE change uh, several times over the last few months. Um, I've even seen some people jokingly say in regards to Jayco that uh, one week they're complaining about tape on a cabinet because of infection control and now they're telling me to reuse my mask and gown. Again, we're going to see some changes uh, from the things that we have learned from what's going on. And then lastly, what's to come for you is to take ownership of these ideas that maybe you've bubbled up. Take the really good ones and make them stick. So it's said that it takes roughly 21 days or so to build a habit or to make a new habit. Some people say a little less, some people say a lot more, but the whole point of it is that it takes repetition in order to do it. You have to keep repeating the same behavior over and over again until it becomes automatic or a, a habit, right? Um, but you have to take ownership. You have to you have to embrace that idea in order for it to happen as well. And when I say take ownership, I mean that you want to take the change that you want to have, inspire the others around you to help you drive it home. Um, the best ideas take root. Um, when there is a team who is unified to push it forward. And then now is the time. And I, when I say now, I mean the future is the time. Uh, but making a change during a time when things are new and different is a really good idea uh, to make it stick. Just like I said during a new handover, um, really good time to make things stick. Um, in the future, as things are kind of starting to build back up, use that time, embrace that time for a good change, uh, for the better for you and your department. All right, so we're going to open the floor up for some uh, questions. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to ask you to use the raise hand function, and uh, we'll go ahead and uh, let you ask your question.